Welcome back to Consider This. Melissa and Sherrod here with you. Now, tomorrow is World Children's Day, which makes it all the more timely to discuss the issue of child marriage. Today, we heard in Parliament that seven states have turned down the federal government's proposal to amend their state enactments to ban child marriages for Muslims. Now, uh, Sarawak, Pahang, Trunganu, Perlis, Negeri Sembilan, Kedah and Kelantan have all refused to raise the minimum age for marriage for Muslims to 18. So to better understand this multifaceted issue of child marriage in Malaysia, we have on the line with us Sharmila Sekaran, Chairperson for Children's Advocacy Group, Voice of the Children. Sharmila, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now, I want to ask you with this issue, of child marriage. Is it best addressed through legislation? I mean, can you essentially legislate away what has been a cultural practice? Yeah, that's a really good question, Melissa. Hi, good evening. Um, you know, yeah, it's a really good question because a lot of people seem to think that the best solution is to legislate against child marriage. And when we talk about um, legislation, we need to consider whether we're talking about civil legislation or criminal legislation, whether we want to impose criminal sanctions. But that aside, um, you know, a lot of countries have legislated and yet child marriage still happens. It still takes place in a lot of these countries. Even in Malaysia, we have a law, the Law Reform Divorce and Marriage Act, which prohibits girls below the age of 16 from getting married. And yet we know for, for non-Muslim girls, and yet we know that there are girls below the age of 16 getting married. So legislation alone will not solve this problem or, or, or address the issue. It really needs to have a bottom-up and top-down approach. So legislation goes only so far as to um, help people um, tell those around them, societies, that child marriage is bad and wrong and should not be allowed. But like you said, if it's a traditional practice, if it's a cultural practice, if there are reasons other, other than just wanting children to be married early, then um, we really need to look at those issues first before we talk about the legislation. Uh, Shamila, to what extent uh, are these issues uh, about the economy, the structure of the economy? Feudal societies, agricultural societies had their marriage patterns, uh, you know, industrialized societies as they transformed, most advanced ed industrial societies, uh, people are marrying very, very late. And that's because women are part of the workforce, women are going through school and so on and so forth. Is that the problem here? Some parts of the country really well advanced economically, so women are you know, full participants both in education and the economy. In some parts of the country, very rural and so on and so forth, this is not the case and it, it remains largely stuck in a particular era and therefore we see these practices uh, as kind of a residue of a former or, a, or, a, or a, you know, a, an economy now perhaps declining. Absolutely. So there are various reasons as to why child marriages happen. Um, for, for example, the indigenous communities, the Orang Asli and the Orang Asal, we actually see that their, um, uh, their mortality rate in, in terms of lifespan is much shorter than those of us from the more urban areas, the, the more wealthy um, professional classes. So they are passing away at a much younger age, which means they need to start getting married much earlier, much as they did in the past, um, even within our own communities, um, get married early, have their children early, because by the time you're 50, you're going to be expiring. So um, if you want to have that legacy of, of children and grandchildren, then you need to start a lot earlier. So there is that factor. There's also the factor that a lot of children, um, so child marriages are happening for a variety of reasons. Poverty is definitely one of the factors. Um, as long as the children in a particular community are able to do certain things. So, for example, in Sarawak, as long as a boy is able to fend for a family, um, you know, catch uh, food for the family, hunt and, and uh, things like that, and provide, then he's old enough to get married. So um, these are some of the other considerations. Plus the fact that, you know, a lot of children in Malaysia do not fully understand uh, sexual reproductive health. They don't know um, what 
activities or behaviors could get them into trouble. And that's one of the other factors that we're seeing, especially in the urban areas, as to why there are high rates of child marriage, because a lot of these children are having sexual relations early, the girls are getting pregnant, uh, teenage and early pregnancies, and the solution so that we don't lose faith, so that, you know, um, uh, children are not born out of wedlock, is to get the girls married off early. So right. what we really need to do is look at all the drivers, and, and this is one of the factors, um, a sense of hopelessness. For some um, children, they feel that once they're married, then they become adults, in inverted commas, right. and that they're treated as adults, and they look like adults, looked upon as adults by their families, by their parents. Right. Sharmila, so, um, just now you mentioned, uh, you brought up the Orang Asli, Orang Asal communities. You talked about what's happening in Sabah Sarawak. And I think that's quite interesting because a common perception when it comes to child marriage is that this is an issue that's confined to a specific community, to a specific religion, to a specific race. Now, in actuality, child marriages occur in all communities across the board, uh, all races, all religions as well. So talk to us a little bit about that. Also, it happens to both girls and boys, right? Yes, absolutely. So Malaysia is quite unique in that sense because we do not have the kinds of figures that we're seeing in, for example, South Asia, um, where there are high rates of child brides, girls or girl brides. Um, in Malaysia, we're actually seeing an almost equal number of um, boys and girls below the age of 18 getting married. You're having, um, we're, ha we're also seeing incidences where the boys are younger than their brides, the, the wives they marry. Okay. Um, and sometimes the girls are older than the boys are, are adults. The girls are like 20, 21, and the boys are 16 or 17. So they are, you know, um, it's the reverse of what we presume. Um, and also, if we look at it demographically, what we are also seeing is an almost equal number in terms of um, uh, the number of people within a particular community. So whether it's the Indians, the Chinese, or the Malays, and Orang Asli, um, an almost equal number of um, non-Malays getting married as well, or non-Muslims getting married as children. Uh, Shamala, so what Malaysia is quite unique like that. Yeah, Shamala, you know, we've had some high-profile cases, and I wonder, you know, where you have a much older man, someone in his 40s marrying a, a teenager, you know, 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old. Now, uh, a lot of people scream pedophilia when they, when they, and pedophile when they see, uh, read about these cases. Has that in some ways distorted our view of this? Is child marriage essentially about uh, uh, legitimizing a pedophilia? Oh, no. Um, yes, so there is that factor where, um, which we're seeing quite a lot of, but if you actually look at the number of child marriage cases, a lot of them are uh, of more similar age, where the boys and girls are of similar age. There are very, very rare cases where it's a much older man and a much younger, a, a, you know, a teenage girl. Mm. Um, but, you know, pedophilia, we have to understand that pedophilia is actually, in a sense, it's, a, it's, a, it's an illness. You know, much like alcoholism or gambling, it's an illness. Just because an older person gets married or, or, or has sexual relations with a much younger, with a child, it doesn't necessarily mean it's pedophilia. It could just be, most of them are opportunists. So um, a pedophile is someone who's been diagnosed as a pedophile with a, with a, as an illness. Everyone else is an opportunist. Um, what we're also seeing are cases where they need to legitimize a relationship. So really, it's a case of um, girls indulging in sexual relations much earlier, at a, at a young age, not knowing and understanding what they're doing fully, because they're not being given the right kind of education, the full extent of education that they require in school. Um, they're engaging in sexual relations earlier, and as as a response to that, so that we don't, you know, so that they're not loose girls, in inverted commas, they're being made to get married to these people that they're having sexual relations with.
Uh, so what about, we really uh, need to yeah, do. We have a few minutes uh, remaining. I just want to uh, ask you about the question of political will. I mean, th this government is getting a lot of uh, 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 sort of negative feedback about the, the progress of this whole issue. Uh, we, so we had the recent announcement uh, of seven states. Now, they're evenly divided. Uh, Pakata Harpan uh, has two states, uh, two states are under pass, two states are under yeah. Amno, and one, of course, under, you know, the, the, the territory of Sarawak is there as well. So it seems like it's across the board. I mean, how do you read the politics of pushing through this legislation? I think a lot more work needs to be done on the ground. The problem with legislation is that very often it will affect the people who are most who have who do not have access to justice. So it's going to be the poorest who are going to be penalized. It's going to be the people who do not have the necessary awareness because of where the community is, you know, um, with very little access to um, broadcasters and, and media and advertisements and things like that. These are the people who are going to be hit first and foremost with any kind of legislation. Um, what we really need to do, what I would really like to see is for this government to have a moratorium on child marriage and to put themselves on a very strict timeline, whether it's two years or five years, I think five years is quite reasonable, to say we're going to go to the ground and we're going to educate people. Because when the information is given to people, a lot of people seem to think it's a Muslim-only issue. So there are a lot of non-Muslims who do not want to talk about this issue because they think it's, oh, you know, it's Muslims, let them sort it out. When the um, data that we do have, although it's very little and it's not, uh, we need disaggregated data, um, the data that we do have shows that actually it's a little bit more evenly spread. So we really need to do a lot more work in terms of raising awareness and teaching communities why child marriages is not the way to go. And to hear from the children, Voice of the Children, we recently um, released a documentary on child marriage on, um, at the end of uh, August. And the children we interviewed, completely unsolicited, the children we interviewed, all of them said, child marriage is bad, don't be like me. You know, they, they all came up with very similar um, phrases that they prefer that they would have had a different life and not to get, have got married early. Sharmila, thank you so much for speaking with us and sharing those insights uh, and, and shedding some light into this issue. We're going to be back with more on Consider This. Make sure you stay tuned.